malice is a deliberate, intentional, un intention unlawfully to take away the life of another human being. In the state of Georgia, malice can be formed in an instant. Now, when I have the opportunity to argue to you about the evidence in just a few minutes, I'll show you where the malice was something that absolutely was there. It wasn't formed in an instant. It was formed time and time and time again. But all that is required is malice can be formed in an instant, and it is the un unintentional, excuse me, the unlawful intentional killing of another human being. That's exactly what the state proved to you through the evidence in this particular case. Premeditation isn't something that's required in the state of Georgia. I expect the judge is going to tell you about that. Premeditation isn't required, but sometimes in certain cases you will find that somebody premeditated was premeditated in the killing of another individual. But it is not required, and malice, as I told you, can be formed in an instant. You're going to be looking at those murder charges. What is felony murder? Felony murder is when you cause the death of another human being when you're in the commission of another felony. You look at those particular accounts for the cruelty of a child, all right? And the way the state indicted those charges and the grand jury indicted those charges is that, again, this defendant committed the offenses of cruelty in the first degree when she intentionally, unlawfully, and maliciously caused Imani Gabriella Moss, a child under the eight, age of 18 years, cruel and excessive physical and mental pain by withholding necessary sustenance to sustain life. Again, that's the underlying felony. If you find that she had the intention to withhold food, that she withheld food and water from that child, and that it caused, it was cruel and excessive physical and mental pain, that is cruelty in the first degree. In count five, it was charged that she caused and willfully deprived that child of necessary sustenance, food and water necessary to sustain human life. Those are the two different ways that the state indicted the cruelty in, to a child. Those are the two counts that support the two felony murder case counts. If you find that she committed cruelty to a child and it caused the death of Amani Moss, she's guilty of felony murder, whether she had malice or not. Obviously, the state will submit to you that malice existed. It is murder in the first count, and then we have sustained and will show you how we proved the other two felony murder counts as they were drawn with the cruelty to a child in the first degree as the underlying offenses. And finally, you're going to get to concealing the death of another. It's the last count in this particular indictment. And in that particular count, it talks about how when you conceal the death of another, you conceal the death of an individual. In this particular case, it was indicted as a Monty Moss. The child in this case, and that you did hinder the discovery of whether that person was lawfully or unlawfully killed. In other words, they concealed her death. The intent was to conceal the death so law enforcement or anyone else would not know, in fact, the manner in which that child died. That's how the state proves to you concealing the death of another in this particular case. Now, I expect that what the judge will also instruct you is about different terms of law. And certain things and, and ideas and things that the law stands for that you will have to consider. It's going to talk to you about parties to a crime. Parties to the crime in this case because you heard the testimony of Amon Moss, the father of Amani, who was previously charged in this particular case in the same manner who entered a plea of guilty. Two individuals can be parties to the same crime. If you intentionally participate in it, if you are willful in it, if you encourage another, if you aid them, if you abet them, if you do any of that, you are a party to the crime of which they are committing. You may find certain things that Amon did specifically and certain other things that this defendant Tiffany did, but if they did it in concert, they are parties to a crime. And when you are parties to a crime, you are guilty just the same. If the state proves to you beyond a reasonable doubt that you committed those offenses for which you were charged, even if there was another individual that was assisting and helping you, you are guilty of the exact same offenses if the state proves that to you. And I would submit to you that the state proved you each and every count within that indictment against this defendant. Now, you also talk about um, the judge will instruct you with regard to the cruelty. There's also the malicious element in cruelty. It's a little bit different than malice when it comes to murder, but not that difficult to understand. In cruelty, I expect the judge will tell you that malice in that particular is not ill will or hatred necessarily, but for the purpose of that code section, malice means an actual intent 
to cause the particular harm produced. That is, physical and mental pain without any justification or any excuse. It's also, malice is also the wanton and willful doing of an act with an awareness of a plain and strong likelihood that such particular harm may result. In other words, if you set out to starve a child, the likelihood that you are going to cause mental and physical pain, you should be aware that that's something. If you find that that's in fact what exists, then you find malice and cruelty to a child because that is the necessary end of your actions when you don't feed a child. That's cruelty in the first degree. It's a little bit different than malice when it comes for the malice murder count, but ladies and gentlemen, the state proved it to you just the same. And finally, in the beginning of this argument, I wanna to talk to you about intent. Intent is a necessary element that the state always has to prove in every single criminal trial. And intent is such that it can be expressed or it can be implied. And you can have the intent, you can form the intent, it's the intent to commit the act. You may not intend to break the law per se, but if it's the consequences of the action that you have done, if it's the natural consequences of your actions, that can show intent. It can be inferred. There's lots of different ways that you can infer intent in this particular case. And as I said, I'll have the opportunity to speak to you now, and I'll have the opportunity to speak to you again in just a few minutes. But at that point, I'll show you just exactly how the state has proven the intent in this particular case. Those are all important elements, uh, important um, premises of the law that the state has to prove. In this particular case, ladies and gentlemen, there was a lot of evidence and I know that the judge will instruct you on the law after I've had the opportunity to finish my closing argument. But what I want you to think about is how exactly we did that. And when I speak to you again, I will explain to you exactly how all of the pieces of evidence that you sat and you listened to that were brought into this courtroom, the testimony of the witnesses that came before you, how all of that fits together. Because there may have been times where you were wondering to yourself, why exactly does that matter? Why exactly are they tendering this photograph? Or what does that particular record indicate? At the end of my closing, I will explain to you how each of those pieces fit together to show the malicious murder of Amani Moss by cruelty to a child, and then how, in fact, this defendant concealed her death. And at that time, I will ask you to render a verdict that speaks the truth, because the truth in this case is that the defendant is guilty. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Moss, your closing argument when you're ready, ma'am. I want to make the closing argument. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Jones, your final argument. Yes, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, um, this, this case is different. It's different for a lot of different reasons. Um, it is different because I'm sure when you were selected as jurors in this case, sometimes, as I said to you very briefly in my opening part of my conclu uh, conclusion, that um, we see things on television, we see things on the news. Um, maybe some of you uh, indicated in jury selection that you'd watched other trials. Um, over the past several years, things that were high publicity and maybe you saw how things went. You might have had an idea of how things are supposed to go in a courtroom. Um, maybe you thought about how there was supposed to be a more adversarial nature. Um, maybe you thought the judge would be making more rulings and two objections and things of that nature. Um, and those things didn't happen in this particular case. Um, and so that is different. Um, that's different for the parties involved. It's different for the court. It may be different for some of you as jurors. 
But what's not different, what's not different about this case are the rules of law and exactly what is required of you as jurors in this particular case. Because what you are to decide in this case is whether or not the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt that this defendant committed the offenses for which she is charged. And that when you were selected as jurors and we questioned you, and I know either Mr. Porter was the one or myself, depending on which juror you are, we asked you the questions. And we asked each and every one of you whether when you came into this courtroom, no matter what the circumstances were, no matter how this trial went, no matter what may be different, whether or not you as jurors could put all of that aside and decide this case based only on the evidence that came before you in this courtroom from that witness stand, from all of those exhibits and evidence that were going to be admitted, and base your verdict solely on the evidence presented to you. Each and every one of you said that you could do just that. And that is why you are seated there now. Now is the time to fulfill that oath as a juror, to follow the instruction of the law of this court, and to base your decision and your verdict in this case only on the evidence that came before you in this courtroom. Because that is what your evidence, what your verdict should be based on, only the evidence in this case. Let's take a look at what that evidence is. And when you do, you have to go back in time and you have to go back. When Mr. Porter talked to you in his opening statement, he told you that this all began in 2010. And that is, that's exactly when it began. It began in 2010 when Amani was a six-year-old first grader. Now, you go back and you heard the testimony of Amon, and granted, you knew that Amon and Tiffany had been married just prior to that in 2009, and that Amani had gotten to know Tiffany. He described their relationship the entire time that they were together as somewhat of a love-hate relationship. You heard that testimony, a love-hate relationship. The state would argue and submit to you that in 2010, just a year later, was the turning point in the entire relationship between that child and this defendant. It was in 2010 when she was that first grader. And as you recall the testimony from Detective King, when she told you that when she talked to Imani and she spoke to her to find out how she had gotten those bruises, it was because she was told to do her homework by this defendant and that she had five minutes to do her homework and that when she didn't get it done, that she got, that she got beaten. She got beaten with a belt. This defendant stated it was only two or three times. Admitted that though, admitted that to Detective King. It was only two or three times. But what you saw, ladies and gentlemen, was you saw the evidence of those two or three times. Because it wasn't just two or three times. It was time and time and time again. Because you can look at those pictures and you can look at that evidence and you can see that that child had bruises all over her body. She had bruises on her legs, on her arms, on her back, on her chest, everywhere, at the hands of this defendant for not doing her homework when she was six. What started after that particular time was an utter and horrible downfall because the relationship was effectively over at that point. Because this defendant blamed that child Blamed a six-year-old for causing her to lose her job, not be able to have her career anymore that she had gone to college for, that she wasn't able to work, and along with it came financial hardship for that family. As you heard the testimony of Amon Moss, you heard about how he talked. He had to work multiple jobs in order to try to help. And what ultimately happened was they had Tristan. It was later in that year. The birth of Tristan came and they had to move back in with family. That they would rely on family in order to help them because of the financial hardships. They are there. They are living. They're back over there. And time and time again, he would say, we lived back with family. I would work. We would move back out. We would get different apartments. We would go back. We would move back to different apartments. Move forward to 2012. Two years later, you heard about when they were living alone because they, weren't li they were not living with a family member at that time. And you remember, let's I take, I, I should go back for just a second because back to 2010, 
Remember what happened? Imani was removed from the home. She was actually removed from the home and went to go live with her grandmother, Robin. And when she went to Robin's house, remember what Robin told you. Robin told you about how she thrived, how she did better in school. She was finally safe. She was okay. She was doing her work. She didn't seem scared. But what occurred? She was removed back from Robin's care, even though Robin fought for her. And she was put back in the home with this defendant and her father. And what happened? It all started occurring again. Because as I told you, they didn't live with family anymore. They had moved back out. And now you move forward to 2012. You move 2012. And what did you hear? You heard from officers who came before you about the incidents that happened that summer. You go to the summer of 2012, just after Armani had finished third grade. At this point, she's nine years old. She finishes third grade in early July, that first week of July of 2012. She runs away to the leasing office of the apartment complex they lived in. Third grade, just finished third grade. She's at the front of the apartment complex and she tells them that she doesn't want to live at home. She wanted to run away because this, her stepmother was not nice to her. Police are called, and when they interview Imani, you heard from Officer Hill, and he told you, she said that she, the week before, seven to eight days before, she had tied her to a chair and put her in a cold shower. She didn't have evidence of bruising anymore, so what does he do eight days later? He goes and he speaks to this defendant. And what does she tell him? Remember what she told him? She said, she's just jealous. She resents my relationship with her dad. She's jealous of me and her father, and she resents her new little brother. She just wants attention. I don't really do any more disciplining of her since I'm on probation. I don't really discipline her anymore. I leave that up to her dad. And with that, the officer didn't have enough probable cause to charge her with a crime. He saw no evidence of bruising, but what did he do? He followed up, he put through a report, hoping that something would be followed up, knowing that this defendant was on probation for beating that child. But he had no other choice. And so what did she do? She went back to that apartment. After this defendant knows she's gotten the police involved and is afraid to come home, and she goes back and has to continue living there. So then what happens? It's not even four weeks later. It's the end of July, and yet again, what does she do? She is nine, and she runs away. She runs away again in the middle of the evening of that summer. She goes out the door. This defendant knows it, but doesn't call the police for several hours until a mom got home. Remember what Officer Kirshner told you? It was when her father finally got home a few hours later when he realized his daughter was not there and had not come home. He's the one who called the police, not her. Nine years old, running outside, and has no idea where that child was. But when a mom gets home, he calls the police to try to find her. And what happens? Detective Kirshner told you that what do they find? They find Amani at almost one o'clock in the morning asleep in the dark in the bushes of the front of the apartment complex. She was nine. That child was nine years old and would rather be in the dark alone, sleeping in the bushes than in the room next to her. What was life like in that house when no one else was watching. You move forward and fortunately at that particular time, what happens? But she gets to go back to school because finally the school year started because that last event when she was sleeping in the bushes was the end of July. So a week, two weeks later, she's back at school. She gets to go to a safe place. She's in fourth grade. She's in fourth grade. She eventually gets in, in October of that year, she ends up in Mrs. Neal's class. She is thriving. She is doing well. The only problem she had was about her homework. 
When she went home, that was when it was difficult to get anything done. That was when the problem was. But in 2012 and into the early part of 2013, she was safe. Because during the day, for the vast majority of her waking hours, she was with somewhere else. She was not in that house. She was not in that apartment or living anywhere else. She could go to school and be a child. She could go to school and be a fourth grader where she could thrive and she could learn and she could smile and she could fill a room with joy. And she was safe. But what happened? We get to the end of that school year. We get to the end of that school year. Remember what Miss Neal told you? Amani never had one discipline problem. She never got sent to the principal's office. She wasn't disrespectful. She was never defiant. She did not have one issue with that child. And what did Amani talk about the most when she was at school? Her little brother. Her little brother, who she said she talked about constantly because how much she adored her little brother. The same little brother that this defendant just a few months earlier had tried to tell the police that she just hated. She was jealous of. She resented him. That same little boy. But when you hear her teacher talk about it, that's all she talked about at school. So we get to the end of that school year and you get to field day, but actually right before that you had Mother's Day. And you heard the testimony about Mother's Day in 2013. Because they gathered at Sharonese house. That was Amon's sister. And remember, it was Sharonese and her kids, and it was Amon and Tiffany, Amani, Tristan, Emma, and Robin, the grandmother. And what was different about Amani? You saw the photographs. What was different about Amani? It was her hairstyle. And they immediately, they immediately noticed that something was different. Because Amani had always worn her hair long. She'd either worn it in a braid in the back or in pigtails on the side. She always had beautiful long hair, and it was cut off. Completely cut off and not really styled, just cut off. Sharon East immediately noticed it, but she waited to confront her brother until a little bit later. She called her brother and said, what did you do to, his, to her hair? What happened to Amani's hair? And what did he say? Oh, she did it to herself. She cut her own hair off. Sharon East did not believe that for an instant. She knew something was wrong. But then there was Robin the grandmother. And what did Robin do? She didn't just wait. She didn't call her, her son later. She confronted the defendant herself at that particular day. She confronted the defendant herself. What did you do to my baby's hair? What happened to her hair? And what did the defendant say to her? If you act ugly, you get to look ugly. If you act ugly, then you should look ugly. She said it to Robin, to her face. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if she would say that to Robin, to her face, what do you think she said to that child when no one was listening? You are ugly. You are worthless. You are nothing. Move forward a couple days at field day, and you've got field day where there they are running and playing. You'll see the pictures of that. <clears throat> Ms. Neal took those pictures. The last pictures we have of Amani alive. Ms. Neal told you that at the end of that school year, she weighed about 50 or 60 pounds, 50 to 60 pounds at that particular time. That she, yes, Amani had always been thin, but she was fit. She seemed like a normal, active child. She was petite. But she was healthy when she left Miss Neal's class at the end of that year. And where did they live at that particular time? You heard the testimony of Pearly Bashir and you heard the testimony of Brittany Brown. You heard the testimony of Amon Moss. All of them. They lived at Pearly's house. And they had lived there for the majority of that school year, from October and into the summer of 2013. They lived there. And why is that important? Because they lived with somebody else because there was always someone else watching. Someone else could see there were other adults around. It wasn't just this defendant and Amon taking care of those kids. There was another adult 
two, three more adults because Brittany lived there and a male friend of Brittany's. Other people saw them. And so what did you hear from the testimony of Pearlie and Brittany? She seemed fine. Amani seemed fine. Amani would eat when she was at our house. Everything was fine. Yes, there were typical issues that happened between a stepmother and a stepdaughter and children in general, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary when they lived with us. But then what happened? Wanted their own place again, didn't they? This defendant and Amon wanted their own apartment, and Amon was working at that particular time already two full-time jobs because this defendant had never gone back to work because she had had Tristan, because she had Emma in September of 2012. Now she had two small children and she had Amani and she had not been able to go back to work as a teacher because she was on probation for beating Amani. So what do they decide with two full-time jobs by, uh, by Amon? He told you they had to have three times the salary or his salary had to be three times what the rent was. And so what did he do? He did it. He worked 16 hours a day so that he could get a three-bedroom apartment, two-bath apartment for this defendant and his children. That's why the work records, you see the work records to show that in fact, yes, that is where Amon was going 16 hours a day. But in the end of August and early September, what did they do? They moved to Veranda Chase here in Gwinnett and that was absolutely the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of the end for Amani because they moved to that apartment and now what? There is no one else watching. And what do they do? They decide they're gonna homeschool Amani. They're gonna homeschool her. Sharonese, Amani's sister knew immediately there were red flags at that moment. Yes, she was a trained teacher, but she hadn't taught in years and clearly the relationship between her and Amani was not good. She had two small children at home and Sharon Neese immediately said, red flags went up. This was a horrible idea. This was a very bad idea. Why would you homeschool her? And what did she do? She was so concerned, she called DFACS. She reported it again, spoke on the phone with DFACS because she knew that this was not gonna be okay. That Amani was not going to be okay being homeschooled. Because what was homeschool? Homeschooling was code words for isolate and hide. We can isolate this children from everyone she knows. She will not see friends every day. She will not see her family. She will not have a teacher that can save her and protect her. She will be in this apartment and the only two adults will be this defendant and a father who is gone 16 hours a day. She will be hidden from everyone. You heard the testimony from Pearlie and you heard the testimony from Terrell Bethay, the neighbor that lived there. They are the only two people that could tell you that for the months of September and October of 2013, they even saw Amani. Pearlie told you she saw her one time if she thought she remembered right. She saw the back of her when she was sitting at a desk doing homework but she didn't really talk to her. Brittany said she never even saw Amani when they moved to that apartment. Her own aunt, her, the defendant's sister, didn't see her. And one neighbor says, I remember seeing the other children often, but I only think I saw the little girl once, the older girl one time. Why? Because she never left that apartment because she never went outside, she never went anywhere with them as a family because she stayed in that room. Homeschooling? No. There wasn't homeschooling going on. You might have asked yourself when we entered, as I said, certain pieces of evidence and you're thinking, why, why are they putting in these text messages? Why do these text messages matter? Why do these phone logs matter? What is the relevant of some of these pictures or these photographs? Well, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, because what you can do is you can look through State's Exhibit 30. State's Exhibit 30B, and it's specifically those phone, those text messages. And it's the text messages off of Mon's phone. But they are the text messages that go back and forth between this defendant and Amon Moss for the month of October. And what you will find is you will find that it was just normal at that house. It was just a way of life. 
everything was fine. And you will see in these text messages, it was about food. It was about taking care of Tristan and Emma. It was about small daily life. But the only text messages or references you will find about Imani in these messages for the entire month of October is about what a pain she was, about what she did wrong, about having to deal with certain things and how it was. But what is the defendant sending? Because these are the types of things that would go back and forth. In the beginning, and you look at it because they go from the back to the front, it's kind of interesting about food, October 3rd of 2013, from Sexy Wifey, who identified as the defendant in this particular case, um, to Amon, bring me a burger if you get out, off when you eat out. That's on October 3rd. And then she goes on and she talks about, well, bring me that burger. And then she starts talking about Amani. She starts talking about Amani on October 8th. Why these things matter, they matter, and I'll show you why. She starts talking about Amani. I told her last night that if it starts itching, do not touch it, because that's mean it, that means it's healing. She picked at it again last night. Now it's not hard anymore, and it looks infected. She starts talking about that. Um, what do you... Well, what could that have been? October 8th. She's picking at her, and then she goes on because she criticized it again. She said she did it because she didn't want to listen, and she felt like picking at it because it was itching. Well, she goes through, and she, he talks about her where her, your daughter was picking her bottom or picking her butt. What, why, why is that? Why does that matter? It matters because you heard the testimony of Dr. Stauffenberg. You're the testimony of Dr. Stauffenberg. What did she talk to you about? What did she talk to you about what was on Imani's backside, on her bottom, on her left buttocks, that was scabbed and healing? It was a decubitus ulcer. And what is that code for? What is that big speak for? That is for a, a bed sore. Because that child was laying in that bed on the, in the same position day after day after day. But what is she texting about? Bring me a burger. I cook tonight. Oh, wait, there's another one. Um, she talks about those types of things. Um, the Blu-ray is out. So, Tristan, can you, can you help me do this so Tristan can watch Netflix on the back TV? Maybe that seems insignificant in normal life, but it's not in this case. Because what she's doing is she's taking care of Tristan, and she's taking care of Emma, but she's not taking care of Amani. She's not feeding Amani. She's not taking care of her when she's sick or when she's hurt. All she does is complain about that child. Because that child was ugly, and that child was nothing to her. She was a nuisance to her. She goes on, and in throughout here, you will see where she talks about, hey, um, she talks about, well, can we do this or can we do that? She talks about going to the movies. And then here it is, October 13th. Your child picked at her ass. That's what she says. Not to mention she picked at her face, too. By October 13th, think about how bad the sore's getting. But before that, she does all of this and she carries on. Oh, there's text messages in here. You can look. I'm craving chocolate. Can you buy me some cookie dough on the way home? Can you buy me some cookie dough and maybe some brownies so I can make them? Do you think she was feeding any of that to that child? She's sending pictures of chicken and rice that she makes on October 8th. The same day that Amani's lying there and she's mad about the fact that she's picking at her own scabs and her own wounds. That's what she's doing and that's why those matter. Because when you look at it, ladies and gentlemen, when I talk to you about intent, how you can infer it from the actions, what is this? You can infer intent because in this particular case, this is so different. Maybe this is another place where this case is different than lots of others. Because in a lot of murder cases, it's a shooting or it's a stabbing and it is awful and it is horrible, but it is fast and it is quick. But not in this case, because in this case, it was intent day after day after day. When that defendant got up and she made that choice, I'm gonna cook chicken and rice tonight, but you're not gonna have any. I'm gonna bake cookies, can you smell those? Can you smell those cookies and those brownies? Because I'm craving chocolate, 
but you're not gonna have any. I'll feed Tristan. I'll feed your little sister with all the food that you saw in those pictures in that pantry. I'll cook that food. I'll make that food for them and for me and for your dad, but not for you. Day after day. You want to talk about intent? You want to talk about malice? That's what that is. Every day you get up and you make the choice that you will not feed that child. That is malice murder. That is intent. But it didn't stop there. It continued. Because what does she do? What is, what happens? What happens on October 10th? She sends a text message about Imani. She burned her damn legs. That's the text message. I think she was reaching for the leftovers on the back of the stove. Now, if you believe the text messages and what her account was, she pulled a pot of hot food or water down on herself and burned herself. If you, if you rely on the text messages, if you lie, rely on what Amon told you, he told you she called and said that she spilled something like that. That's what it was. All right, that's one of the text messages. But the text messages continue, so look at those. And then she says Amani burned her legs with her tub water. Okay, which is it? Is it a pot off the stove when she's seeking food, like Dr. Stauffenberg said she would get to that point when she was so hungry? that she's seeking food and trying to find the leftovers that apparently she wasn't even entitled to? Did she burn herself with the pot that fell off the stove or did she burn herself with her tub water? Now ask yourself the question, why, why does she have a tub water thing that she spills on herself? Because she wasn't in the bathroom in the tub, clearly. Why does she have tub water that's so incredibly hot that she says she poured her water on her legs because she wanted to see what it would do? None of it makes any sense because if she spills her tub water on herself and she scolds herself, well, who got the tub water so hot? Maybe it's the adult at the house. But why is she not in the bathtub? Because she's lying in that room in her own personal prison because that's where she lived and that's where she stayed. So either this defendant dumped the scalding hot tub water on her and spilled it because I submit to you that child didn't pour tub water on herself because she wanted to see what would happen. By the day that she does that and you look at the text messages on October 10th of 2013, she was fatigued, she was starving, she was probably having difficulty walking. But she's searching for food, maybe if you believe that one, but what does the defendant do? She puts a little owl on her legs and puts her back in the room. That's what she put in the text message. I rub some owl on her legs and put her back in the room. You remember the testimony of Dr. Stauffenberg? Those were first or second degree burns. You can see the discoloration on that child's pigment when you look at those <clears throat> pictures that are horrible to look at. But I urge you, you cannot look away, ladies and gentlemen. And you see the burn, eight and a half by eight inches on that child's midsection. You see that burn, that she laid there. Either she laid there because she laid in a bed where tub water that was scalding was poured on her, or she pulled a pot of boiling food down on herself. Whichever one, does it really matter? She got burned. She got hurt. And she needed to go to see a doctor and get medical attention. And she got none of it because they didn't call for help, they didn't call 911, and she put a little aloe on her legs and put her back in her room because that's where she needed to stay. Then she th sends on October 14th of 2013, Amani boo-booed on, on the rug and she refuses to get it up. This is after she's burned, after she's hungry, and maybe about a week before she has an episode that Amon told you about, that she became completely incapacitated. But what is she doing? She's texting Amon, she boo-booed on the rug, and that child refuses to clean it up. Make her clean it up. She's barely able to move at that point, but really, she, she needs to clean that up. She needs to be that responsible 10-year-old and clean up her own feces off the floor when she can't control herself anymore. But that's what she said. And then she's like, I'm sorry for bothering you at work. 
She wasn't a child to her. She was a nuisance and she was a pain. And you wonder about why in the world do they put pictures in of how her room looked and why it smelled of urine. Why do they talk about that? Why are there stains in this corner of the rug? Because I would submit to you that was her bathroom. That was where she could get to. That was where she could at least crawl herself out of that bed onto that floor to go to the bathroom so she didn't always do it in the bed when she still had the energy and the ability to get there. Because she didn't get out of that room and go to the bathroom. She went on her floor. She crawled as far as she could go, and that's what she did. When she could still save herself from doing it in her own bed so she didn't have to lie in her own filth and waste. That's why that's important. That's what shows you how day after day she intentionally ignored that child. Ten twenty one of 2013. Monty's barely hanging on, but remember, and the reason we go with October 21st, Amon testified to you, and he talked about it was, I think it was October 24th. October 24th. And what did Detective Flynn talk to you about? He pulled all the work records. The only reason we go with October 21st is because it's the one and only day that Amon really wasn't at work that day. Because all of this starts to come together. And whether it's October 21st or October 24th, again, one of those in inconsistencies that really doesn't matter. But remember what he told you? He's working on the trailblazer. She's at home with Tiffany. He comes home. He comes in late that night from working on that car. And Amani is in the bathtub with Tiffany. She's in the bathtub. He says it appeared as if she was having a seizure. She couldn't control herself. She seemed paralyzed, as if she couldn't move, her eyes rolling back and forth. And what do they do? We've got to call 911. And what does this defendant say? No, we don't. We are not calling 911. Because she knew they will see her. She is starving to death. They will see, I'm going to go back to jail. We cannot call the police. She will be okay. Leave her. And so what does he do? He picks her up, he puts her back in her bed, and he tells you that from that point forward, Amani never got out of that bed. That child laid in that bed, in that room, for depending on whichever day, for at least five to seven more days. Unable to move, burned on her stomach, not eating, not being fed, not being cared for. And she laid in that room alone. While this defendant went about her life, while this defendant goes out for her sister's birthday, talking about in these text messages, what are we gonna wear? What shoes, what outfit? We're gonna get dressed up. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. Let's get all dolled up and let's take pictures and send them to each other because it's happy. But I have a child in the next room who is near death. But I can just live my life like everything. I will take care of my other children. I will make sure they are fine. But that one, that's his. She's not mine. She's not my problem, but I will dress up and I will go have fun. And then what happens? October 29th comes around. October 29th comes along, and what happens? Amani finally passes. She dies in that room. And why do we know it's October 29th? Because Amon tells you that she called. He wasn't sure if it was the 29th or 30th. But then he goes on to tell you that it was the Tuesday before Halloween. The Tuesday before Halloween in 2013 is the 29th. The call logs that seem like maybe, why are we doing this? The call logs show you that there were only incoming calls from Tiffany on October 29th. There were none on October 30th to Amon's phone. And it goes with the timeline of when he says he found out she died. She died on October 29th, alone in that bed, in her own filth and in her own waste, while her little brother ran around outside playing, her little sister in the pack and play, and when you match up the pictures from the phone, while this defendant sat watching TV and cooking lasagna, 
Amani died alone in a room while all that life was going on around her. So what happens? Amon gets home and he finds his daughter in there when she's sitting there watching television when he arrives home to find his child dead in her room. And what happens? The discussion of what do we do next? What do we do next? Because what we do next is we cover it up. We have to get on our criminal minds. Remember he said that? She said from watching all the television that she apparently sat when she's tuning into Netflix and watching television all day. She says, we've got to get on our criminal minds. We've got to get rid of her. We cannot have her. They will know what we have done to her. We must keep this family together. We will lose our family. Because to her, family was the family of four. It was Amon, it was Tiffany, it was Tristan, and it was Emma. It did not include Amani. And so what happened? We have to get on our criminal minds. And so that's why you see all the evidence that we put in. And that's what happens next. The calculatedness of hiding and saving themselves. Because they get this plan together and Mon, Amon goes back to work. And then he gets up the next day and he goes to work and then he gets off. And that's why you see on October 30th, he goes to the Walmart and he buys a trash can. A trash can in which to place his baby in which to place his daughter, because they have to get rid of her. A trash can and charcoal briquettes. And he gets all of these things together and he comes back home. And he comes back home on the 30th, but they don't do it that night. They wait because he gets up the next morning and he goes to work again with his dead child in the next room. By this point, he tells you he had moved her from that room and he had put her in the computer room. So on October 31st, she is lying in a blanket in the computer room with the door closed. And what happens on October 31st? It's just another day in the life of this defendant. Because she's got her criminal mind on. And what does she do? She gets up and she goes to Anna's Linens. She goes to Anna's Linens so she can buy a new comforter and pillows and sheets. So she can put them on the bed where Amani died. But she scrubs that mattress clean because you remember that one side was clean. Let's get rid of her. Let's, let's erase any sign that that child, that nuisance in my life existed. Let's clean that up. And then when I clean that up, I'm just going to flip that mattress over where it was dirty so the clean side's down. Get rid of all those sheets. I bought a new comforter. You see her on the video. You see her on the still shots. She goes in there and she buys that comforter and you see it match up. That's why the receipts were important. And you see those receipts from Anna's linens and you see her. She's the one buying the comforter and buying the sheets and the new pillows. And we'll just put those on that bedroom and I'll clean that room up and make it look like she was never there. Because I've got to keep my family together because that child didn't exist. She wasn't worthy of living. And so I will put all that together, and then what will I do? <clears throat> when he gets home, we'll get rid of the body. But not before, not before I take care of my babies. Because I'll stop at the Target, and I'll buy them medicine, because they have a cough. They have a fever, and they have a cough. Why does all that become important? Because it shows to you how much she hated that little girl. It shows you how much she would do for her other two children, but she would never do for a mommy. She buys medicine for them when they have a cough, but when that child burns her legs, second degree burns, she rubs a little aloe on and sticks her in a room and says, we're not gonna get help for her. And what does she do? She dresses her other two children up because heaven forbid they miss trick or treating on Halloween while Amani is dead in the computer room, she sends a text message of how cute they looked in their costumes when she took them trick-or-treating with a dead child in the next room. And when Amon gets home from work that night, what do they do? They have their criminal minds on because now it's time to get rid of Amani wash our hands of her. They bind her with duct tape because she is 
stiff. They rip off pieces of duct tape and bind that child's legs together. She was 32 pounds, and they bend her and put her in duct tape, duct tape, on her skin. And yes, she's dead, but just think about that. They wrap their child in duct tape to shove her in a trash bag, to set her on fire in a trash can. She did that. They put her, and what happens? Amon is having second thoughts. Amon is having second thoughts about doing it. And so what do they do? Tiffany says, no, we've got to take care of it. And she scoops up the other two children and puts them in the car and takes them with them to burn their other child, to attempt to cremate their other child. They put Tristan and Emma in the back seat to go along. And they stood outside, and Amon told you, they set her on fire. And what did he say? At that point, we couldn't watch. We turned our backs, and we turned around, but we looked. And you saw the, the evidence that came in. There's no question she was there. There's no question she handled that trash can, even though Amon bought it, because her fingerprint is on it, ladies and gentlemen. And you heard Amon tell you, we turned our backs because we couldn't watch. Mr. Porter told you in his opening statements, don't look away. They couldn't even look at what they were doing. It is that unthinkable and that unimaginable. But they set her on fire and Amon finally had that moment where this is messed up and we have to stop. And they put her out. They put their child out from burning. And they loaded her back up and put her in the back of a trailblazer and drove her back home. But it didn't end there. Because they got back home and Amon, amazingly, went back to work. Goes back to work with that child in the trash can in the back of that trailblazer. Trying to figure out what he's going to do. But what does this defendant do? She sends a fake text message that day to him. She sends a text message to him that day because it's all part of the cover-up and all part of the plan because you'll see it. She sends a text message on November 1st of 2013 at 3.03 in the afternoon. My bad, babe. I was on the phone with Amani's teacher. Amani wouldn't even talk to her. Amani, who's dead and burned and charred in a trash can. But she sends a text message so that somebody else will see, and it'll be all part of their grand master plan, that Amani's still alive. And then somehow Amani's just going to run away. That's what's going to happen. Amani's just going to run away. And they can make it look like she never, ever existed. Like she wasn't there. But what happens, because he's trying to say, we, uh, when he couldn't burn her, oh, we, we needed a barrier. Remember, Amani said, I couldn't bury her. I couldn't do that either. And so what happens, it finally all unraveled. Because amazingly enough, Amon had a moment of a conscience. And he said, I am calling 911. He had talked to his cousin and he said, I am calling 911. And what does this defendant do? No, if you call 911, I am going back to jail. I am in trouble. They will know what we have done. They will take our family. They will take our children. Our children, forget about Amani in the trash can, but they will take Tristan and Emma from us. I can't lose my children. Forget about Amani, the child dead in the trash can. And what does she do? She scoops up those children, she gets in that trailblazer, and she leaves when he calls 911. Amon is absolutely no hero, don't get me wrong. He at least stayed at the place. He at least stayed till the police got there. And what does he do? He makes up a story about, oh, she drank some chemicals or some poison. Because for the first several hours of his interview, he tried to cover for this defendant. Because, why? Because he would do whatever. He tried to cover for her in the beginning of that interview. Detective Flynn told you. And then finally, finally, 
after Detective Flynn had attended that autopsy, and it became abundantly clear how that child died. Did he find me and was able to confront him with that? And you heard about the officers when they arrived on that scene, and Detective Poppy told you about he lifted that lid and saw the charred remains of a child. And he raced over to Pearlie's house, and he tries to find the defendant, but she's not there anymore because she said exactly what she would do, and that was she dropped the kids off with her mom, don't let them take my babies, and she took off. And yes, eventually later, when all she's got is the shoes on her feet, the clothes on her back, $200 in her pocket, and an ID. She turns herself in to a Roswell police officer saying, I think you probably are looking for me. And here we are. The victim weighed 32 pounds. 32 pounds when she was pulled out of that trash can. She had a liver and a spleen half the size she should have. She was less than 5% of the weight of a normal, thriving 10-year-old. She was emaciated, she was skin, and she was bones. And this defendant starved her to death. Her brain was normal size. Why? Because it was doing everything it could to try to help her survive. It was doing everything it could to keep that child alive. And unfortunately, that meant she knew what was happening to her. Because you think about it and you heard about what Dr. Stauffenberg told you about the phases of starvation and how in the beginning you will be hunger and you will feel that pain and you will want for that food and you will search for it, maybe pulling the pot of leftovers off that she never got to eat. You will look for that food and you will feel that pain and it will hurt and then the fatigue will set in and you will be able barely to walk and you will be slow and the mental anguish comes in. The mental part where you can't think and you want that food, that pain and that hurt and that suffering. Day after day after day. And on top of it, that child was burned and no medical attention was sought. Not one bit of medical attention. She was dehydrated and she was likely in kidney failure at that point. And what do you know, ladies and gentlemen? Every day when you see those work records for 16 hours a day, this defendant had to spend every day with the child that she resented. Amani represented to her everything she hated. She cost her her job. She cost her her career. She was why she went to jail. It was why she was on probation. It was Amani's fault she was beaten because she didn't do her homework fast enough. This defendant lived with the person in the next room who she despised, who she did not want, who she wanted to be rid of. To this defendant, every single day, that child represented that to her. She was that. Amani was nothing. She was a nuisance. She was ugly. She was nothing. She was a pain. She was disposable. She was trash. <laughs> she was trash. But she wasn't. She wasn't. She was a child. And she was a granddaughter. And she was a niece. And she was a friend who, to kids who needed one. And she was a student who brought joy to a teacher. She was a daughter. She was a money. <laughs> she was a money. And she mattered. She mattered.
When Mr. Porter came before you in his opening statement, he told you that sometimes justice is difficult and doing the right thing is hard. But ladies and gentlemen, he also told you that you cannot look away. You cannot flinch from what is here before you. And what is here before you is the evidence in this case. And yes, some of it is difficult and it is tough to look at. But you cannot turn away from it. You must face it. You must face it head on because what those pictures are and what these pieces of evidence are and what this represents is Imani Moss's life. It is what that child endured at the hands of this defendant. It is her life and it proves to you exactly what is alleged in that indictment. It proves it to you in each and every element. It proves to you that this defendant intended to kill that child. That she murdered Imani Moss. That she starved her to death. And then she covered it up by throwing her out like she was trash. As adults, we are the caregivers of children. We have a responsibility to take care of them. We have a responsibility to feed them and clothe them and take them to the doctor when they are sick and comfort them when they are hurt and take away their pain and love them. And there are people who wait their whole lives and they never get to be parents. They want a child and they never get to be parents, but they want one. And sometimes in life, we are so lucky that we get to have a child come into our lives, either because we adopt them and we love them, or because we get to have someone else's and we can love them as our own. But as a parent, what you are set to do is you are to protect your children from the evils in this world, and you do that at all costs. You do that at all costs. But Amani Moss, she lived with the evils in this world. The evils in this world and in her life live in the next room. And so when you go back into that jury room and you deliberate and you determine and you render a verdict that speaks the truth in this case based on the evidence that has been presented to you, the verdict in this case is clear. The verdict in this case that speaks the truth is this defendant is guilty. She is guilty of murder, felony murder, cruelty to a child, and concealing the death. She is guilty. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Porter told you, sometimes justice is difficult and doing the right thing might be hard. But ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, doing the right thing in this case, it's not hard. Because the evilness in the world in this case stops today. It ends here. With your verdict that speaks the truth, and the truth is, is she is guilty. That is the right thing. And in this case, it's not hard.